Hey, this is Sarah Hatfield with Strictly Sickly, and I'm here with Brad and Kristen today. Um, if you enjoy, okay, you wrote these notes and I just glossed over them all wrong. As always, while informed, we are not medical doctors. Any advice given on this show should not be substituted for a professional medical opinion or treatment to your specific case. Always consult your physician before making any changes to treatments or routines. Also today, we're going to be talking about uh, suicide, self-harm, uh, assisted uh, assisted death, because we can't call it assisted suicide. <coughs> That's illegal. I'll let Kristen explain why. Um, so if any of those things will bother you, probably skip out on the episode today. Is it the same reason you can't call a bong a bong? or It's a, a water pipe. Or a dildo, a, a rubber dong? It's a cake decoration. <laughs> But so what was the difference? Uh, they were saying that people who call it physician-assisted suicide are equivalating it with euthanasia, which is illegal, so you have to call it physician-assisted dying, which is, I guess, different. I don't know. Apparently, the wording is important, uh, so I, I'm, I'm used to calling it physician-assisted suicide, but I'm, I'm going to have to try to call it physician-assisted death instead to make sure that I'm... Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we can start on the, the legality of this. I know it's legal in a few states in the U.S. Um, I've got a list. I do, too. I have a list of everywhere that it's legal, where everybody is partying. As of March 2018, active human euthanasia is legal in the Netherlands, Belgium, Colombia, Luxembourg, and Canada. Assisted suicide is legal in Switzerland, Germany, and the Netherlands. And in the U.S., the states of Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Hawaii, Vermont, Montana, Washington, D.C., and California. The first documentary I watched was How to Die in Oregon. And I think back when it was uh, put out, only Vermont and Oregon, maybe? Or it was Vermont, Oregon, and Washington. It was really just a small area you could go to in the U.S. to, you know, get offed. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't even know it was legal at all in the U.S., I had no idea. Like, I thought it was completely illegal here. I knew Canada had legalized it, but apparently it's been legal here since, like, 2015. It's the mm -hmm. uh, Act, uh, Death with Dignity Act. Yeah, Death mm -hmm. with Dignity. <coughs> and, you know, there's... Uh, I'm not sure why so many states don't allow it. Um, I, I don't get it, but... Um. Politics-wise, uh, like like we said, it's legal in those states, and I, I know the rules there are kind of weird. Like, the doctor can prescribe you the drug, but you have to be physically able to take it yourself. Yeah, there's, like, a huge list of requirements in order to actually have it done. What? The, uh, what so, you looked up all the, like, legal requirements. What are the mental requirements? Like, do you have to prove that you can make sound decisions? Because mm -hmm. that was my big thing, like... I didn't get into that part of the research, but I was curious about it because I was like, well, you know, ultimately I'm, I'm for it. Like a person should be able to decide when they want to go if, if they want to do that. But there should be like some stipulate. And the first thing that came to mind is I think they should have to be able to mint, show that they can make mm -hmm. sound decisions. Otherwise, people are just going around like lethally injecting people and going, no, no, they totally asked for it. <laughs> Yeah, no, it said that uh, that you have to, uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I'm sick, guys. She uh, is <laughs> currently on the list for assisted suicide. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, uh, you have, they allow mentally competent adults who have terminal illness with a confirmed prognosis of having six or fewer months to live to voluntary request and receive the medication to hasten their death. And you have to, there's two physicians have to confirm the patient's residency, that they live in the state that it's legal in, uh, their diagnosis, their prognosis, their mental competence, and their voluntariness to, uh, to do it. And then there's two waiting periods that they have to do. The first one's between the oral requests with both of the physicians. And then the second waiting period is between receiving and filling their prescription. So they have to talks to two physicians who deem them mentally competent and you know that they they need this or that that they're uh they're going to be better off for it 
And yeah, there's just a lot of requirements yeah. just to even have it done. Well, I mean, that's a that's a good thing. I mean, I don't know. I find it dodgy <laughs> that you have to be able to like take the pills yourself because a bunch of people that probably want to die probably can't aren't capable of swallow. swallowing. Mm. Is one of the things you lose really fat, like an end of life care. They have to thicken fluid so people can get them down because otherwise they aspirate. So swallowing is one of your first functions that goes. Well, I, I can understand the need to want to protect the physician or, or you know the people involved with it because i mean if there's any doubt if they're like from the family or anybody that's involved if there's any doubt at all it's it ceases to be suicide and is a possible murder or manslaughter you have you have to have something in place that removes the doubt or the, or the question about whether or not this was the right thing like even taking like the morality of is killing yourself okay but that it was that person's choice through and through not and they weren't influenced into making that choice like they made that choice for themselves i mean may, maybe there are some things that are in that list that are a little bit extreme but something has to exist to protect the people that are well, involved with helping real, somebody make that decision. We rule on people that make these decisions themselves. They find the pills, they slit their wrists, they blow their brains out. We rail on these people, but they're taking any doubt that it was a murder. Right. I mean, there's, there's, in, in those cases, there's no one else that can be culpable. I mean, we blame, we blame people that kill themselves. We're like, oh, they were so selfish, or it was because of depression, or they weren't in their right mind. Like, we make up a thousand excuses for it. But then when people ask for help and there's no cure in sight, like nothing is making anything better and they just want to freaking die. And so rather than go cut their wrists in a bathtub, they ask for help to die. If you can't help me do anything else, if you can't help me live, help me die. And then we rail on them for that, too. Mm hmm. And so, it, yeah, it's it's a complete. <coughs> so basically, we just hate people feeling sick, and we especially hate people that are so sick that they can't function well, and, like and those live. People who are like, "Oh, you're chronically ill. Why don't you just go ahead and die already?" Then, cause well, you're... you can't even do that yeah, with and... without catching grief. So, like, well, why didn't you try harder? Yeah. Why yeah. don't you go out in the woods and just get eaten by wolves? I've had people say that to me, but there's the same kind of people that are against. Uh, assisted suicide probably for a, a religious angle mm -hmm. yeah but hey at least there's another alternative if uh if you don't meet those requirements in some states there's there's other things you can opt for which i can't pronounce properly but you can sit in a room and let louis ck pal palliative, palliative sedation which is where they just induce uh decreased or absent awareness to relieve your suffering for an X amount of time. So they just, I guess, essentially put you into like a mini coma so that yeah. you don't have to feel pain. And so I guess if you don't meet all of those, the extensive requirements for the physician assisted dying, then you can just get sedation. And the problem with that way. is the hospital bill. Yeah. Um, but so palliative care is an adjunct term to like hospice. So hospice mm -hmm. is in, you have six months or less, a year or less. With palliative care, you don't have to have a date. Mm -hmm. So technically I'm on palliative care for like, they give me the fentanyl patches. That's a palliative care measure um, because I won't ever get better. De define palliative care. Making life. We, which is different than terminal. It, yeah, like, you're never going to get better. We need to make you comfortable. Even if this isn't going to kill you. This is all you have. This okay. is your life now. I've always been careful, like, because you, you've said palliative care a few times, and then all, it almost sounds like terminal care, but I, I knew terminal care was actually mm. different. Hospice. Uh, well, that's when, you know, they come and, like, take care of you. Is your there a timeline on when they go, like, 10 years, 26 months, or whatever? Like, can you be on palliative care for 30 years? Because they know. I, you know. Like I, Stephen Hawking. He was supposed to die in two years of getting uh als and he lived to be 72 i think so was he on palliative care that whole time Catherine's on she might she might know actually better than me she is a nurse <laughs> yeah nurses know things i just know the doctor when well they gave me the gastroparesis diagnosis and they considered it a terminal thing just not in any like they don't know 
It could not be terminal. It might be terminal. And that's when they're like, oh, you're on palliative care, which allowed me to beat the recommendations for opiate guidelines until very recently when they removed that barrier. But, yeah. Uh, but, like, uh, hospice care and stuff like that. So, if they're going to put you in a coma or whatever, you got to pay for people to come take mm-hmm. care of you or the hospital. Which, if you're in a month-long coma, is going to be an insane bill. Mm-hmm. But if the end goal is just to be gone, then I guess you don't have to worry yeah. about paying it. <laughs> I wonder if... Uh, I wonder if that's like when the cable guy comes to your house, you know? They're like, all right, you're not allowed to do assisted suicide, but we can do this coma thing. And then when they come in, you, like, slip them 50 bucks. And they're just like, oh, we'll put you in a really deep coma. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I, I know people do that. I know they assist family members. Yeah. I, I know that's a thing that happens. Yeah, we might not want to call those specific no, people I'm out. No, I'm not. Yeah. I'm saying that is a thing that happens. I've heard tell. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's it's really common. Um, and even though it's an act of mercy, legally, you know, in this state... Legally, that's it's, murder. It's murder. Yeah. They're murderers. You're murdering that person who's never going to get better and lies there suffering. Yeah. How dare you? I, I don't get it. But. Why is it that everybody that follows my link can't comment? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's you. Uh, okay. If if you're watching the show and you can't comment because you got to the show because I instant messaged you the link, stop using my instant message link. Apparently that screws everybody up. Like completely back out of Facebook. Go back in and just go to the Strictly Sickly page and then go to the video that way and see if that fixes it. I think it has something to do with when I send the link out. Or maybe, or they're not opening it the right way. I don't know. I don't know why it would it, why it would make any difference at all. I just I know a lot of people get on and they're they're they they're like, hey, I followed the link and it's let it, either it won't let them watch the show or it won't let them comment. And the common denominator seems to be when I'm the one sending the link out. So. Um, so, uh, I think religious, uh, concerns were another big deal for this. Yeah. Well, that seems to be most of the people's reason for not, for being against it, or just, the, uh, I can't think of any actual good reason why nobody... I, I don't know if it's a I mean, I have a non-religious reason. I don't know that it's a good reason, but it is a reason. Yeah. And I brought it up earlier, <laughs> and it was that, um... From from a medical perspective, it could be seen as irresponsible because there's a lot of people that are terminally ill or on palliative care or something like that. And at the moment, like we like, I guess a good example would be like people with HIV, right? So now we have pills that if if you're HIV not AIDS, but if you're HIV positive, there's pills you can take that bring the virus down to such low... It doesn't... It's not a cure, but it brings it down to such low levels. Yeah, the cocktail's gotten really good. Yeah, that if you go get an HIV test, it doesn't show up in the testing. It's the, like... So you can live a perfectly normal life with HIV. Like, the your life expectancy isn't shortened at the all The cocktail's anymore. pricey, but yeah. Right, but it can be done, right? And that was through a lot of research and in testing on people that had HIV... It's also a like preventative that. measure now, too, like if you get a needle stick or if you're pregnant and have HIV. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because if you take it before it, you know, it could keep you from yeah. actually getting... But anyway, um, but go back five years... Back ten, to the 80s. Yeah, to the 80s when they were first getting that, you know, and it it was. It was a pretty horrible nightmare, and I'm sure a lot of people wanted to die, or I'm sure a lot of people did kill themselves, you know, because it was so bad. But the thing was is... um. It could be seen by medical professionals or science or, you know, anybody as irresponsible to prematurely terminate somebody's life when a cure could come around the corner or whatever. And so, and it's not necessarily that, like, you did something to them against their will. It's that it's going to feel morally irresponsible to the doctor that went ahead and okayed that and said, I agree with you, go ahead and kill yourself, basically. It just for like, you know, a couple of months down the line, if they had convinced them to stay alive, there could have been 
a cure or some kind of development yeah, or something say, like that. Say you have a brain tumor and you off yourself and two years later they came up with a cure and your life expectancy was longer than two years. Right. Because yeah. in the case of HIV or AIDS, uh, you were pretty much dead in a few months. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> maybe I'm giving a bad example, but as far as like the narrative that I'm, I mean, that's the thought process. It's like, okay, like, yeah, your life sucked really bad then and somebody might decide to make that decision because they're living in that moment, either because of pain or any of the other reasons I looked up, and they go ahead and do it. But within the time frame that they still had left to live, something could be done that could actually just fix the whole solution. Or it could have been... Or solution. It, it fix, the, yeah. fix the whole problem. Well, I was thinking uh, even like the counter-argument to that, I guess, would be... Um, even if they came up with a cure or something to kind of help it out, it doesn't necessarily mean that it would have worked for them or if they could have afforded it or anything like that. So but they might have some been suffering longer. But yeah, it's, it's something. Point, and it's and it's from the perspective. It's, it's really from the, the only valid argument yeah. I've heard. I just I see it as from the perspective of somebody that has talked somebody <laughs> through it and helped somebody decide that death was the best option for them. That's a that's a big burden to shoulder when you've helped so, and you may feel really confident about it today when you see somebody suffering you'll feel really confident about it today well i hope that person not suffer anymore but then new information comes to light later that makes you think oh my god you know yeah i hope that person was suffering but if i had only you know, it's second guessing yourself. There was a girl on, um, and, and like I said, it's not a good argument, but it is a non-religious argument. There was a girl on a CRPS group I'm in. So CRPS is incurable. It's considered one of the most painful pain diseases in existence. Luckily, most people get it in a small portion of their body, like their hand. Now it can spread, but there was a girl on the board that was maybe nineteen, twenty. She had gotten it at twelve, full body CRPS. So it's everywhere. It's in her organs, and it is a death sentence. It it kills you eventually. It just takes a really long time. And she posted wanting to off herself, and people berated her. Oh, you're giving up, and think of how your mm -hmm. family will feel. F how her family feels. <laughs> just from my well, and, and there's the flip side of that argument. It, you know, it's if you feel that bad where you want to die, and everybody's saying, well, it would be really hard on us. If you did that, mm -hmm. well, shit. Who is the selfish person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, we, we constantly <laughs> like to berate people that take their own life for, oh, they were selfish and they were just doing it for themselves and they were being short sighted. But what about the people that are making you stay around and suffer? To what end? So that they can feel better, so they can watch you suffer. Yeah, I mean, it's it, way more selfish to me is to demand somebody stay alive. And, and it's also a hard argument, and it's just like the argument we had last week. Because it's hard to be, it comes from a place of love. You're doing these things because it comes oh, from Oh yeah, the exorcism thing. People do it because they love someone, but then yeah. the person dies in the process. It, it would hurt Which so much to like see either one 60 of 60% of people are just fatally injured. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah, mm. oh god. Just exorcism. as a side note, ex exorcism kills people. But, um, um, but so you have, you have better chances with assisted suicide than you do exorcism. That's... <laughs> That's what that statistic told me. The point me. was that the family that seeks these things, they're doing it out of love. They want you to stay alive out of love, but it is a selfish behavior. Yeah. It's, it's, it is, and it's, I also think it's not fair to label something selfish or not selfish, too. It's just human nature, and human nature is attachment, either to your own life or somebody else's life. I mean, you get attached to people. We're not... Even if you are a loner, we are not truly solitary yeah. creatures. We are, we're pack animals. And so when a member of our pack, you know, goes away like that, everybody feels it. it. And it does affect a lot of lives. So it can go both ways. Yes, you can say that the person that's making that decision is selfish because they're thinking of their their own needs above the rest of the pack. But then... I mean, it's also selfish on the, the other side, too, because the, the pack is being selfish for saying that, no, you should suffer to make us feel better so that we feel like a complete unit instead of grieving and moving on. Well, religious, re you looked up all these religious reasons. I want to know what different religions think about 
Uh, okay, well, I looked up the, the major ones, or which ones would you like to know about? Because I have lots of But you of said them. Wiccans were brutal. They are brutal. Okay, so apparently it's not, it's, it's not like a general consensus. Apparently they do all kind of have their own thing. But some of the stricter forms of Wicca believe uh, that because of... Uh, they believe in reincarnation. They believe suicides are reborn and endure the same exact circumstances in each lifetime until they develop an ability to cope with those circumstances. So they Jeez. think, yeah, that you kill yourself, you're reborn, you have the exact same problems, and then if you continue to kill yourself, then you're just going to keep doing it over and over and over again until you live through it, I guess. But, yeah, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> Um, hospice, uh, so on oh no, a sorry, uh, <coughs> hospice care and palliative care does not have a time limit. My grandparents are on hospice, but they are not terminal. Medicare pays, yeah, because uh, when my grandfather, or Stephen's grandfather, passed away recently, he was on hospice, and they honestly had no clue. It could have been a day. It could have been yeah. That's how it was with my grandma. Uh, she had cancer, and they kept saying it could be a week, it could be a year. We don't know. And yeah. they just. Allie says when you're that sick, you kind of have to be selfish about a lot of things. That is true, because no one else is feeling what you're feeling. Even if you have the same conditions, no, no pain is the same, no suffering is the same. And even if, I mean, there's people who say, well, you should have just lived through it. If you've ever watched somebody suffer like that for a long time, like, have you ever been around somebody yeah. who's dying or or just suffering, period? It is awful to watch. And there was a point in time that I, I really wanted to just put a pillow over her face because just watching her suffer like that was so rough. And I couldn't imagine how she was feeling. And so if anybody walked up and said, well, you can't do that. She needs to just live through this. I probably would have punched them. Yeah. Well, cause... first off, she's not living through this. Yeah. First, this is she's death. going to die, but I would rather it be quick and painless instead of this. Yeah. So. Is it uh, Catholicism that thinks it's a uh, oh, mortal a sin? Well, according to uh, this, pretty much all of them, except for Christianity, prohibits suicide, uh, which is kind of ironic considering that a lot of the uh, right wing Christians well, we know would but say. I was bad. raised a Protestant and I was never taught suicide was a mortal sin. I was taught there is no mortal sin. Yeah. Well, the, the conservative Protestants, like evangelicals and stuff, they said that it's self murder and that it's unpardonable, unpardon, pardonable, uh, not because of the suicide itself, but because you can't ask for forgiveness afterwards. So it's like the the refusal of the gift of salvation is what they said. So that's that's why it's a sin is because you can't bleh. But um, yeah, Catholics say it's violating the thou shalt not kill, but they believe that God would grant them repentance. Um, Judaism, it's frowned upon. And that they'd be buried in a separate part of the Jewish cemetery. And some of them don't get the mourning rituals. Um, Muslim says that suicide is forbidden. And it's only the militant groups that carry out the, the suicides. Mm -hmm. And they don't support that view. Um, Buddhists do not advocate because they believe all people suffer from past deeds. They don't condemn suicide without exception. Um, but they think that uh, the reasons for suicide are negative And they counteract with the path to enlightenment. Um, yeah, Hinduism thinks it's spiritually unacceptable. Um, if you die by suicide, you've, it results in you becoming a ghost and wandering and to never attain the blessing of heaven. I can personally attest that that doesn't happen. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, then there was the, the Wicca, which was the brutal, brutal one to me. You're living so, that over and over and over. Yeah, just keep doing it until you can. <coughs> mm. So I'm, I think our personal opinions are important on this one because all of us have, well, I mean, your back hurts now, Brad, so chronic pain. <laughs> all of us have, all of us have some sort of chronic illness, whether it be mental or physical. I did, I did have one more, oh, go ahead. I, I did have one more argument against, like oh, if God. we're, if we're still on that. But um, one of the big ones, and this this comes directly. We have no cohesive timeline here. Sorry, <laughs> it, but this one comes directly from doctors why they don't want to do it, and it's um, directly related to the Hippocratic Oath. 
Um, and, you know, it's that whole do no harm thing, which is kind of subjective, but um, the direct line that gets quoted out of the Hippocratic Oath is, I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor suggest any such counsel. And I mean, that it's a very specific line yeah. that's part of that oath. And th- <laughs> there is kind of no wiggle room for interpretation there. If, if you have vowed... I think at, they should take that out of there. Mm-hmm. Well, and th- there is a big kind of petition against that. But that's one of the reasons um, in the this, here in the States that we you mentioned... You have to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's it, like they'll prescribe... I don't even think they prescribe you the medicine. I, I, th- I think they go through like a third party or something. But there's there's some way to totally take the physician out of the equation there. Like you still kind of go through it. It's weird. It's like a wording and it's totally <laughs> subjective. Yeah. Because I think doing no harm could also be considered forcing someone to live in a miserable way. Yeah. Well, yeah. D- I, I think... W- Allowing somebody to suffer is doing harm Mm -hmm. in in my head. Like, if you know there's nothing you can do to help someone, but you're just allowing them to continue to suffer when they don't want to suffer anymore. Catherine just made a really good point. Um, She messaged you, um, why is there a death penalty then? Yeah, right. Like, we believe in the sanctity of life. uh, Well, I mean, if you're asking me, I don't believe in a death penalty, (laughs) but... Mm. It's not, I'm neither here nor there on the Well, because okay, well, I I do know I I know how others are justifying it because if you're a criminal that's uh, that warrants the death like where you're deemed to get the death penalty, you've done something so heinous, you've lost all your human rights at that point. Like um people that are sentenced to life imprisonment and death are thought to you have no rights anymore like solitary confinement i think is a worse punishment than death and they do that all the time um i think it would be subjective to say that it's worse than death but it is definitely worse than almost any it physical punishment that nutty well i mean you can't ask a dead person if being dead is worse. you know yeah. so well, we try <laughs> <laughs> yeah we we do specifically um um but so so you can't do so you can't make a factual statement that it's worse than death but any physical torture or anything like that psychologically um and physically we know solitary confinement is worse than any kind of physical torture that you can undergo long term mm-hmm. um so we can infer that it's probably worse than death but you can't factually make that statement mm-hmm. but um i I don't know what all warrants the death penalty other than murder. I think you have to... It's that... It's thought, well, that person took somebody else's life or multiple people's lives. So they don't get that choice. Over the, and so that's kind of how people justify it in their head. I don't agree with the death penalty. And I say that knowing that there are some horrible things that people have done. And I'm like, man, they need to fry them <laughs> So, I also uh, that's a whole nother episode but I don't agree with the way they enact the death penalty yeah the, the administration because it costs more that. money than keeping someone in prison <laughs> does it? Just t- yeah just take them out back but anyway so just put them in the freezer like my dad did with you know my pet mouse um Catherine's talking about the way they administer the uh the end of life care so I watched a documentary called How to Die in Oregon and basically in the United States, they were saying that people have to be able to take and swallow pills. In other countries, they might do an injection. But here, I don't think they've ever done that. There was that doctor back in the day who Kevorkian. was working, And there are nurses, you know, angels of mercy, mm-hmm. who have taken up that. Uh, okay. He, okay, just because it's related... Do you think what Dr. Kevorkian was doing was wrong? Because I don't know enough about it. He gets painted as a... Well, he had a van, and he was doing stuff under the medical... If you wanted to assist... He was a doctor. If the people really wanted to die, no. But the question becomes, did he talk people into it? It's unknown. Or, I don't know. But he's really treated like a villain. Uh, he was a medical MD. That's how he was able to get a hold of the stuff to do it. And the... It was assisted suicide, and it was mostly painless. But he was, like, doing it out of the back of a van, mm-hmm. you know. Um, 
Ironically, it all comes full circle to the ghost hunting thing because now Zach Bagans owns Dr. Kevorkian's van. Of course he does. Um, so another thing I wanted to bring up is, personally, I think we all agree that assisted uh, death should be a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your lines? Do they have to have a term? Because I'm very liberal on this one. I am too. Do they have to have a terminal illness? No. Do they have to just be in pain or do they have to be <laughs> depressed? I think as long as they want to go and you can prove that they were mentally competent to make that decision that they want to go, then it should not matter. I'm torn on it. Like, I don't... It's one of those things, like, I don't like, but I accept that your life is not my life, so people should have a decision on... Their life. (laughs) Yeah, and, um... It's like my abortion argument. I don't like abortions, but I'm not going to tell people (laughs) that it should be illegal. It's... I think everything is circumstantial. I, like everything in life has to be taken on a case by case basis. There, I don't have a, a like a black and white line for it. Honestly, um, I do think they need to I, they need to be able to prove mental competence mm-hmm. that they're they're not just nuts and they're aware of death and the finality of it and that it, they can make that decision um, as long as they can prove that honest as much as I don't like it I don't think the reasons are anybody's business like if you're a hardcore drug you're not in pain or anything but you're a hardcore drug addict you don't think you're ever going to get better the 12 steps haven't helped you and you're like you know what I've hurt my family enough I really just want to die legally you should have the right to make that decision it's your body it, yeah. And I think you shouldn't be a financial burden on somebody else that hasn't agreed to it either. So, like, you can't just decide that without making, like, arrangements, mm. right? And then it's like, you just get a call in the middle of the night where somebody made this decision on their own. It's like, well, now you got to pay for a funeral. Like, that's not right either. You shouldn't be able to burden other people with your final expenses and stuff like that if you're making the decision to die. I think that's fair maybe not realistic but i'm just saying i'm just saying like in a perfect world i look at it like a tattoo like it's permanent it's not going away but it's your body and if that's what you want to do go maybe for you, it, maybe you need to be 18 eh. to be able to you I, you should probably have to be a legal adult to make I, that decision. What if you're a six year old with terrible cancer? And then well, then you happen. have to be <laughs> you have to live to be an eighteen year old with they horrible had, cancer. Uh, they've had cases. Um, you better have that Benjamin Button disease. Oh sure. oh, she's talking. Sorry, I answered her question wrong. She was talking about lethal injections for the shots, not the pill for assisted suicide. Mm. Uh, I think we're going to do a whole episode over the death penalty or something later. Yeah, we need to, but yeah, they do shots, gas. I think those are the two ones now. I I thought you were asking a different question. I thought you were asking about the assisted suicide, or assisted death, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, But, because I, uh, so I've weighed this out before in my head. What am I worth alive and how much would it cost for me to be dead? Yeah, what's the balance? There? Yeah, what's the balance it out? Like, it comes down to practical. Stephen would have to pay for daycare. Um, he, you know, he wouldn't have me at home to watch the kids. Uh, but they're almost old enough that that doesn't matter. And what um, if you're a single parent? Th- then it's almost not an option at it's all. It's not an option. That's it's like, a, that's another way in which single parents are very pigeonholed into living life, and they have no life. Yeah. I, I mean. Uh, with my mom was single parenting that's she had no options like if she disappeared i was alone there was no oh i can just kill myself and live well you know in the netherworld happy and fancy free no you gotta take care of your kids i guess unless you make because me and steven made uh, arrangements for uh, people know like we haven't gone through it formally which we need to do we don't have the money i'm gonna kidnap one of them for mm-hmm. well yeah, really we want our friends to take care of like because uh, our parents are all getting older, and 
yeah, you got to go with the longevity yeah. of it. It's like if you're, if you're putting your money down, don't send them with the grandparents because then they're just going to have to deal with two parent deaths. Mm-hmm. But I mean, have you done... I, I, when you became chronically ill and realized that probably your quality of life wasn't going to get any better, did you weigh that out in your head? Yeah. yeah. See, I don't think yeah. that's an abnormal thing to do. I figured how much of uh, of our paychecks are going to keeping me alive how much could Food, Aaron clothing, have yeah. just by himself if I weren't around and what exactly am I giving and I don't have kids so the only thing that I'm giving at home is I clean the house and I'm sure he could have someone else do that so honestly there's I, I don't have any worth to me being there other than companionship and the only reason I, I can't do anything like that is because no one would take care of my cats and I, I don't want to leave my cats behind. That's like the only reason. We can put them in the coffin with you. That's I'll kill you. <laughs> well, you don't even cats. and you don't. We won't even kill them first. Go out like an <laughs> Egyptian. <laughs> I take care of your cats if you died. Um, I think a, a really important thing to the discussion is um the reasons for wanting to do it because it, mm. it, the first thing that comes up to every, and the first thing that came to my mind was because you're in pain. Oh, you're in so much pain. You, you want to die. Pain, pain, pain. And that's the first thing I thought of. And then when I was when I did my few little bits of notes, uh, it turns out pain is the last reason. Although I would argue that all of these things can be caused by pain. They're related mm-hmm. to pain, but it's not the reason. I, I think people can live with pain, like an excruciating amount oh, of they pain. they can. Yeah. I've and, experimented and, on this myself. And, and, as, and as long as they can function in the other aspects of their life, like in in... It's a nominally the, normal it's fashion. It's not the pain that gets you. It's the isolation and misery and It's not the fall that kills you. It's anything, the sudden yeah. hit, yeah. hit then. It's the loneliness and the boredom. Yeah. Uh, but the, the actual poll, the three most frequently mentioned end-of-life concerns reported by Oregon residents who took advantage of the Death with Dignity Act in 2015, which is cruel and unusual punishment. By the way, it's making like, them do a survey. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's like as exit they're dying. Survey. Hey, can you can you do this exit survey for me? <laughs> just fill it in. How was your experience today? One yeah, five. It's, <laughs> it's follow up calls. <laughs> like, um, so the top three were uh, decreasing ability to participate in activities that made life enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Um, and it. it Ninety-six point two percent of them said that that was their top thing, uh, or no, no, not their top thing. It's just of the things on the list. Um, loss of autonomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ninety-two point four percent said that, and then loss of dignity. I have all these things. Can I off myself now? Yes. <laughs> Dignity. I yeah. I mean, you you hit all the points for wanting to do, it. and I, and there were there were like a hundred and thirty things like they could have checked off. That was the top three, mm-hmm. and out of the hundred and thirty like reasons, like where they could have like ranked them and 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 checked them off, however they did the survey, pain came in dead last. It, it like one percent where where people thought that the, where that was their main reason. But the thing I've noticed about pain is it's a secondary thing. Like people list, oh, so they died from. CRPS, they shot themselves. They died from pain. Yeah, that, that's what they died from. You, you lost your mobility because of pain. You mm-hmm. lost your your ability to be autonomous because of pain. Unless it's from, I, I mean, if you have cancer and you're they they cut off your legs, uh, a lot of it is because of pain. I, I mean, shortness of breath and heart issues would be another big one, but. Uh, losing your dignity you can't shower properly anymore yeah someone's got to wipe your butt it's kind of because there's nothing worse than when i go in the hospital and get a pick line and they have to do an effing sponge bath <laughs> because they specifically do that with pick lines because i'm so prone to um cellulitis that and it's awkward and i don't want to make eye contact and they don't even wash anything besides my limbs but i still hate it it grosses me out i don't like it i don't want to have to do that for the rest of my life i would definitely kill myself if that was a thing that would have happened yeah Mm -hmm. so it it more falls under dignity than you hurting it's yeah you're hurting and it's causing all this but ultimately like you don't feel human anymore yeah and and the hurting doesn't. And take you feel away. like a burden. Mostly, you feel like a burden. Yeah, the, the the pain isn't what takes away my want to be alive. It's the I'm a burden on everyone around me. I'm a, a financial sink pit, 
And is it really more harmful to my children if I'm alive and they're constantly having to wake me up in the middle of the night to make sure I'm not dead? Or if I just kill myself? Which is worse. Except for the whole blame themselves factor. That's always the... Yeah. And the top one on that list is definitely understandable. Because, I mean, if you can't enjoy anything out of life anymore, are you really living at that point or are you just kind of surviving hey you're getting and philosophical there plato i'm just saying if, if if you're alive but you can't do anything that you love to do and anything that you that makes life worth living then what's the point yeah Catherine says the cause of most of those issues pain is the root cause unless yeah. there's a neuro issue yeah it's yeah pain or whatever caused by your illness but mostly it's pain or in-laws Huh, yeah, but I think people see pain is is more a, a result that comes alongside of these things, other than the cause. Well, and also we can't forget like the main argument again, which isn't once again isn't a good. Well, in our way of seeing the world, it's not a good argument, but it's the, the main argument is a real touchy one. It's that slippery slope argument about it and, and that that's what the, that's what most of the main people in bioethics are bringing up is this slippery so slope it's going to turn into eugenics mm-hmm. there are many healthcare professionals especially those concerned with bioethics who are opposed to p which is physician assisted suicide due to the detrimental effects that the procedure can have with regard to vulnerable populations this argument is known as the slippery slope this argument encompasses the apprehension that once PAS is initiated for the terminally ill, it will progress to other vulnerable communities, namely the disabled. And maybe get, and, and this is what you were talking about before, is like, do you have to be terminally ill, or can you just be depressed? Or uh, And so what I actually just agreed to was what the slippery slope people They're were worried, worried about. The slippery slope, slope is going to be people that don't want to die. They're worried it's going to turn well, right. into yeah, yeah. It, it'll other Namely, the disabled may begin to be used by those who feel less worthy based on their demographic or socionomic static. In addition, vulnerable populations are more at risk of untimely death because patients might be subjected to PAS without their genuine consent okay so i don't believe in slippery slope, slope arguments i've seen this a billion times when it comes to but ultimately um, they're, they're saying that like no i'm gonna I, let, let me finish <laughs> okay so when it comes to gay people people have been saying this forever if you allow gay marriage people are going to start having sex with kids there is a very clear line between consenting adults and non-consenting children if you cannot see that line i am disturbed by you if you think that it's a slippery slope from being gay to pedophilia you're the problem there is a very clear line between people who very much want to die and people being pushed into that i don't think that's a slippery slope i think it's a black or white well in in that particular argument i just read it's like a three-stage slope where it goes from where letting people die just because they're disabled not not just like in pain or terminal I don't think it's but slippery disabled slope. i think that's the thing you should let people do okay mm-hmm. and then it goes to people <laughs> should be allowed to die just because they just don't like their lives it's your body you do what well, you want suicide is legal in the u.s so right. they already are able to do that right and then, and then the final part of that argument is that well eventually if you get past all that, then you'll get to a point where, and See, I, th- I, I think, think that's, I, I think, think that's, that's the, thing. I think that's the line right there yeah, where where it would never go past. Line. That's the pedophilia line. It's, yeah. In all those other situations, the person has decided whether it's for good reasons or bad reasons is Fair none reasons. of none of our business. Mm-hmm. Like you, you don't get to judge people on their moral reasons for what they do to themselves if it doesn't harm other people. So that slippery slope argument that they're proposing there actually goes all the way up to that final step until it crosses that line where it's like, well, and then we'll get to the point where people are killing other people against their consent. No, that's the line. Consent that's murder. <laughs> consent is always the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in every in every slippery slope argument just about consent always ends up being and that's what line. bothers me about these slippery slope arguments is these people don't, they literally don't understand consent. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it, that's where it comes from. It's the people that are making slippery slope arguments, once they get to the like, well, it's just going to lead to bestiality. You don't understand consent, sir. Yeah. We need to take you your dog me. away. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're playing fetch with your dog wrong. Uh, Catherine says it's more like when they have a power of attorney involved, it would be like their family intervening and deciding. I, yeah, I think that would be against the... I think that's on the black side of that black and white line. Your family cannot decide this for you. Yeah. Pretty goddamn gray area. I mean, it's really... Honestly, if you in a perfect world, people are responsible enough to, before they get to that point... They've told their family what they want. Like I'm, they sh- need to put it in writing. Well, I know, but but it's but that's what I'm saying. It needs to be officially done. Like, how long do you want to be on life support before Six one of us? Six months. See, I wouldn't even go that far. I want I want ample chance to wake up and have medical interventions. I'd say three months. That's long enough for them to go, eh, and then. Just do it. If I had the money, I would have all these things written because, let's face it, I'm probably going to die unexpectedly in the near future. And I want to make sure that everything is as I want it. Well, it's on your podcast, so. Yeah. Um, so so she said says, six uh, months, guys. Power of attorney. Um, does the daughter uh, that has a power of attorney just want the crazy mom's money? Um, then what if you see she's suffering and she can't speak for herself? That's why you need... That's why... That's why it has... In the medical field, I mean, it always has to be written. Well, and it, it, it's that way now. It has to be cut and dry. Legally, it has to be cut document, and dry. Document, the, the, document, the, the, There has to be, like, end-of-life uh, instructions. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's why they have DNRs. Yeah. Yeah, I'm already the, registered for what's going to happen to me. Like, they come and they take my body, and they know what to do with it, and then they send back the ashes a month later. I just want yeah. them to scoop out all my organs mm-hmm. that I haven't destroyed yet, mm-hmm. give them to people that are unfortunate enough to receive them. I don't the, think I can even donate most of my organs. Yeah. <laughs> Yours are probably all just mush. Yeah, mine are shut. I'll take them. <laughs> the thing that I'm registered for is they take me, they take all the organs that they possibly mm-hmm. can use, and then they use my body for science, science for a I month. And then after the month is over, they cremate you and they send it back to your loved ones. But my parents then, are very against cremation. So, well, yeah, but I feel like that's more like they're probably going to have a harder time getting over it than me. So mm-hmm. maybe I should do what they want. I don't know. You're dead at that point. Doesn't I want to really be matter. stuffed and put in one of y'all's rooms, like in the corner. Not in my room. Allie wants her ashes put in that stupid T Rex by uh, yeah. in Dinosaur Glenrose. Valley. Aaron and Aaron wants, wants to be made fireworks. Yep. I've got everybody's. I'm going to get arrested trying to put Allie's ashes in that T Rex's mouth. Do y'all know what I want done with my body? Science. Um, stuffed and put in the corner of one of our rooms. <laughs> no, no. What I really want done. I thought you said what? you wanted to be donated to science. No, I never said that. I said oh. take my organs, then burn the rest of me with my favorite guitar. Oh yeah, your guitar. Oh, yeah, while Mike no watches. Deserves it, yeah. While yeah. Mike yeah. watches. But <coughs> I've had this conversation with Steve. We actually sat down at the point when I was not able to eat and when I was having the seizures, and I said, "You know, I'd like to really honestly talk about one day. You know, this might become too much for me." And in which case I might take the option of moving to Oregon or one of these states where this is legal. I I don't, there is a a requirement for how long you have to have lived there before you Yeah, residency status. um, I said this might become a thing I want to do because if I ever decided to do that, I I don't think, the problem with committing suicide here is you pretty much got to do it alone. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, whoever is with you is, culp- is culpable. Yeah, that's another thing I wrote down was the laws on that stuff. Yeah, and I want people to be able to say goodbye, and I want to like, oh, let's watch Family Guy for the last six hours. You know, mm-hmm. whatever. I don't want to die alone in a, the La Quinta in Cleburne. The more realistic uh, idea then is probably to take a vacation in the Netherlands because there isn't, there isn't a residency requirement there. Hmm. And it's just a really cool fucking place to visit. So, you know... All that money you would have spent moving up to Oregon and establishing yourself to get all that residency, just use all that money for a badass vacation. Well, that's in there. There was that. Um, maybe it was the documentary you're talking about, but the the old man. Oh, that was a different one. Yeah, that went to the yeah he, somewhere else. Yeah, he went to the Netherlands to do that. He just took a big family vacation. In the end of the vacation was okay. Bye. Papa's going to sleep now, and then <laughs> and then everybody came home. But you know what's interesting is every everybody that they interviewed in that family was really happy with it. Mm-hmm. They they felt really good about it. He had a really great like yeah. last two weeks. You know, he sucked it up. I think ate cheeseburgers. Probably did heroin legally. Mm-hmm. 
Hey, you know, just whatever he wanted. Yeah. But I just, I, I, like, having that conversation with Steven, I like that he was, like, supportive of it. He was like, you know, I'd rather this not be a thing, but after observing this for 10 years, you do you. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, and we have a severe double standard with the way... Uh, you know, it's funny because you brought up Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying, oh, the way we regard human life is what's just perfect. Really? Because um, if a dog gets really sick and we can't afford its health care, we'll put it down. Well, so Caitlin asked about a sick family member. She said, first, are they going to get better? Are they going to be miserable? Why don't we euthanize them? And she just did not understand. She was like, well, why would you let a human suffer, but you won't let a dog or cat suffer? Yeah, we we care more about our pets than we do um, humanity. But Catherine said, uh, for like Alzheimer's or dementia patients, the problem is some of those things come on so fast, they wouldn't have time to write it out. Um, and by the time it's diagnosed, they're too far gone to make those decisions. Well, you know, I'm not saying the system's perfect, but, yeah, I, but, that, I, but I'm saying when you're young, like younger than us, eight, like when you're in your 20s, you need to stop for a minute and give some serious thought to how you, at least then, at least you have a starting, but you can change it later if you want. Mm-hmm. But when you're like 21, you need to sit down and decide some things like that very seriously. You, Especially you, when you have kids, I feel bad for not like having ironed out places where my kids are going to go. If me and Steven die in a flaming, plane we can crash. make a whole episode out of that. I don't mind taking you to go have that done. It's only like fifty dollars to have <laughs> those papers drawn up. All but, I can think about is the fact that in Aaron's will, he left everything to you like years ago, and he hasn't gone to update well, it. I give everything. So whenever to you. he dies, I'm like, thanks, Aaron. <laughs> well, you know, we give it to you. <laughs> Well, it, it, I, th- I think that gets old once you get married. Though. Yeah, it is. Know. And the there, state of Texas it automatically goes to your spouse. Yeah, it, and there's like, like you can go get an official will done mm-hmm. and even have it notarized. <coughs> and a lot of times when you die, it still gets overrode. Uh, like, yeah. like that's what that's what happened with my dad's stuff. <laughs> that like I was supposed to be uh, executor or whatever, and it was just like, yeah, whatever, dude. And then they just. <laughs> yeah, we had a family member's will get overrode a few a, a, a decade ago, and we ended up spending all the money we would have gotten for her, uh, what she left us in freaking w- the lawsuit, even mm-hmm. though it was very clearly defined what she wanted, and she wasn't married. Just if someone wants to cause a kerfuffle, they will. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it's... And people trust me with these things, like there's people in my family that are leaving money because they know I'll spend split it where it should be split yeah i would never take what someone else is Mm -hmm. i'll let the state decide where my stuff goes Hmm. i I figure there's going to be no one more impartial than the state to me because they don't give a crap they're just going to burn your house down they're like that's good good no one deserves it if if you ever get caught breaking, what did you do to deserve anything after i die if you ever get caught breaking law in your house they can just take it um i think you know what? I need to redo my papers. I want it to be a game show after I die, and oh, it should God. be it should be this like trivia thing about me, and like uh, they should get uh, Drew Carey to come and host the whole thing, and he asks everybody questions, and if you get it wrong, you're out. And the the people that like answer the most questions, they get it all. Miss Chenandler Vong. <laughs> um. So what? I think everybody has a line that. They they won't go past that's the, the, the call it the uh, kill yourself line. Mm-hmm. What's your line, Brad? I don't know. I don't think I would ever kill myself. Mostly because I'm. That's just not me. But I mean, I fear death. And 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 I don't have a line for somebody else. Like I really feel like it. Like I don't have to like it. But at the end of the day, it's not my business. Like I'm not gonna like it. But. I'm not going to fault somebody for making a decision about something that doesn't belong to me. It would be like somebody coming in here and telling me, you can't paint your room blue. Man, F you. Get out of my house. I'll paint my room whatever color I want, dude. Well, you know, if you paint your room blue, it means you're a racist. It means you're an idiot. Go, you know, it, I don't know. So I, I don't, I guess my line is if I have to do it, Sometimes I wonder if people don't think they have a line, but if they ever got a chronic I mean, pain I could, disease, I, they might suddenly very quickly find their line. Oh, oh yeah, 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 you get perspective, but like, I mean, if if it comes down to it and you're like, 
I need to die. And I'm like, okay, I understand that. I support you. But you're like, the only way we can do it is if you blow my head off with a shotgun in your backyard because we're out of options. I want to go to jail. That's my mm-hmm. line. <laughs> I, I, Am I going to get no, in it's trouble the suicide for it. line. What's your suicide line? Uh, I'd probably do it in a heartbeat. Just, I guess I, if I had any unfinished business that I needed to do right away. Because you don't want to haunt. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't want to die and then be like, oh, shit, I left the stove on. You know? So, That's why you don't take pills, because then you have an hour to go, oh, all the things I yeah. have up. Like, oh, I forgot no. to do that thing. You I have didn't, time to regret. I forgot to say goodbye to that one friend. Oh, God. Statistically, the moment you most want to live is the moment after you've already done the deed. That's screwed. why if I am going to do it, it's going to be autoerotic asphyxiation. <laughs> Oh, I've got a great... Okay, so... Oh, God. I don't remember how long ago this was. There was a guy, and he had... I don't remember... I think he was terminally ill and depressed. Catherine says quadriplegia. uh, Being quadriplegic, that's her line. That's a good line. Yeah. I could... uh, Do I have people to take care of Can you shoot me full of heroin on a daily basis? If I'm going to be a quadriplegic, I just want to be high as balls (laughs) until I die. I mean, I think I could. I think mentally, I could live with you know not being able to take care of myself as long as I have people that love me to take care of me, and pay attention to me and talk to me and still interact with me. So I, I'm not. I feel like, like such a burden, though. I I would, but I feel like a burden. I can walk. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Okay, sorry. Back to your uh, auto oh, oh, association story. Uh, God, it's funny that this reminded me of that <laughs> guy wanted to kill himself. Right, man. It was before it was legal here. I think this was like 2013. And um, so he saved up all his money, emptied out his bank accounts, went down to Mexico, got... Oh, yeah, party, then decided he... He, he bought every barbiturate you can think of, uh, cocaine. Like, he was, he was just going to do it. But he bought, like, five hookers and just had, like, the craziest night you could possibly have. Took all these barbiturates, thinking it would kill him. Woke up the next day feeling great had like banged five hookers the day before or whatever somehow didn't get an std and decided he want he's like you know what life's not so bad like came back <laughs> he'd like quit his job walk back in the door they're like what are you doing here he's like you know what i can do a better job like life was just better he's and uh they did like an interview with him like three years later <laughs> like talking he's like best decision i ever made he's like if you're ever feeling like really bad about yourself just go bang five prostitutes down in In mexico Mexico. and do a whole bunch of drugs that aren't legal here i guarantee you'll change your mind i think he like vacations down there every year now (laughs) road trip (laughs) i mean i see where he's coming from like that's a pretty damn good cure for depression you know it's like yeah yeah he's got something to look forward to every year yeah that would have to be one of those things, though, that he, he probably didn't suffer from, like, a chronic illness or whatever. He, I I think he does have some kind of physical ailment, but he decided, like, eh, it's not so bad. If you can find something to hope for, that's why a lot of people with chronic illnesses funnel it into some sort of hobby. Or for me, mm. it's getting to travel. Um, if, if you can funnel it into something to look forward to, you're a lot less likely to off yourself. Yeah. Like if I can go, oh, in five years I get to take a trip to Alaska. That's a reason to live for five more years. It doesn't have to be something good. It just has to be something. Something well, was, that's good to you. Mine yeah. was terrible. I was reading a, a, a manga and it had like three chapters left and I just kept saying, well, I can't die now. I have to know how it ends. And so I just had to keep waiting for the chapters to come out. So even if it's something small like that. Like, I have to know how it ends. I can't That's die a good yet. enough reason. What did Allie <coughs> say? Uh, Allie says, if anyone is wiping me and I don't know who anyone is anymore. So severe disability and Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah if I, I want to put that in my will. If, if I get Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, just immediately shoot me. I can't shoot you, though, because then I'll get in trouble. Okay, shoot me up with morphine. I used to say Crohn's disease would be my thing, and then I got it. Because <laughs> when I was a kid and we were real assholes, we used to make fun, like it was funny to us as kids. And then, you know, I'm older, and it's like, oh, I feel really bad for all that. I don't know. After watching so many family members with Alzheimer's, that is not something I want to live through. Yeah. Ever, ever, ever. 
I've it is awful. Quite a few things now that I, I've seen people live through. I'm like, if that's ever me, just no, I'm not doing that. Cancer's real dependent on the type of cancer. I yeah. know, but um, a lot of things. Mm-mm. Yeah, just no. Like my nanny got dropped at the nursing home, broke her leg, and drowned in her own lung fluid. That's not how I want to go out. No. It, it, for me, it would really depend on my sharp, like my mind. Cause that's really only. I mean, I'm fat, overweight. Late, you know, I don't do a whole lot anymore. Like I like playing me. You know, I always say like, oh, if I broke my hands, I'd really hate life because I couldn't play music anymore. Blah, blah, blah. I could live through all that crap. But if it's getting to a point that I'm not cognitive, like I'm not sharp, I can't think anymore. I can't carry on conversation, and like I'm no longer myself. That would be my line freaking off me at that point. I mean, I don't see it coming anyway. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, if if I can no longer function at a mental level where I can still feel superior to you. <laughs> that was Oh, sorry. Go. <laughs> I was going to say uh the the main reason for any kind of recent thoughts about it for me at all are because of the brain fog thing because I can't focus to do anything, so everything that I enjoy doing, I can't really do anymore, because I just, it, my brain won't connect with anything. Yeah. So, yeah, when it's in that that mental thing, that's where it was the worst. I can deal with the pain and the fatigue and the blah, blah, blah. But the second that I try to read a book and I can't read more than a sentence without forgetting what I was reading, that's just, it's torture. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, I was going to say, that's when it really kicked in bad for me is that one year that was so bad. It's like I didn't get out of bed for days. I couldn't read. I couldn't pay attention to a TV show. I couldn't talk to everybody. My memory was so bad. I couldn't remember anything. Mm-hmm. And that's when it got real what's the point and I didn't think I'd ever get better and eventually I got enough better that I was like okay maybe I can survive I can like this but, but the, then it the, will come back sometimes like I'll have a flare and that brain fog will come back and I'm like well this is forever now yeah and, and there and there's the real bad argument there's the really good argument is that when your mental facilities are going is like are you in the right frame of mind to make a decision about whether or not you want to live or die he goes well you know they're not all there well crap did they really want to live like that anyway but you know they could come back but i was cognizant enough that one night when i decided to off myself that i was able to go to steven and say hey i really think you need to our guns are safely locked up but i can get into the gun safe Mm -hmm. uh you need to remove those from the house and someone needs to sit with me because i i talked to you about it I, i need to see a shrink ASAP and a doctor because something is very wrong here and I'm going to kill myself if someone does not have eyes on me mm-hmm. and I was so scared to go to the shrink because I thought they were gonna lock you lock up you put up. me on a hold but when I explained it to her she she did not because she she asked a bunch of questions about my support system at home and I told her all about it and the, the reality of it is if you're cognizant enough to say I need to see somebody because I'm gonna ki- like I'm gonna kill myself I need to see somebody or do something about it. There's that want of like most people don't actually do that, mm-hmm. it, you know, because it's they're not at the they're not really at the end yet. Um, it, when I had to snap I, out of the whole, I'm going to go off in the woods and not tell anybody about this to being able to voice that to somebody. Yeah, mm-hmm. in that in like I'm not saying it's like a hundred percent thing. Like this isn't a, I'm a just cry like, for help is still a cry for help. Yeah, yeah. St- statistically, people that are talking about it or think something is wrong with them because they're having those thoughts sort of thing are typically going to not do it because they're going to find some kind of help or they're going to be proactive in their own solution and the about only it. difference with that was it, i i knew it was because of mental stuff uh, like it clicked in my head and i went this is not because i'm sick or in pain yeah, this yeah. is because my brain chemicals there was a part of your brain that still had logic to it that said hey the rest of your brain's not working yeah. correctly mm-hmm. yeah it's I, i've been there just with regular depression where it's like man i feel like anxious or sad or whatever but the other part of my brain's like there's nothing really going on like in reality to cause this your brain's mm-hmm. just messed up but people say it, that, which uh, doesn't help by the way but with self-harm like uh it was a cry for help it wasn't an actual suicide attempt i don't understand when cries for help became invalid yeah yeah 
I'm like, maybe you should take five seconds of your day to say, hey, how are you doing today? It's not that hard. Well, it just it became not, uh, initially when pe- I think when people started saying it was a cry for help, it was something like, hey, we didn't they were asking for help and we didn't recognize it. It was initially brought up that way. It's like these are these are cries for help. These are things that we should look for and be proactive about helping people for. But then it became a euphemism for attention seeking yeah. for attention seeking which is not the same thing like i had a family member self-harming a few years ago and <coughs> i recognized my own bias when i went oh they're just doing this because they want attention then i went well maybe if they need attention that bad i should give them i'm some. missing something <laughs> badly I'm, I'm doing something drastically wrong yeah now. i mean that is a good point and then and that's not like a a slam on anybody that might not be the person giving the attention or something like that. But yeah, like a, well, in this case I was the only one, even there in wasn't a, a lot of people to give it, even a but. severe and unreasonable cry for attention. Still at the end of the day, a cry for attention. And yeah, maybe it's, maybe they're asking an unreasonable amount of it, but you should still be, paying attention to the fact that they're going to those extremes yeah. and, and are going to need some Either level of help. Either they have a defect mm-hmm. or they legitimately need more attention. Either way, it, it doesn't matter. It ma- requires attention. Yeah, yeah, the reason doesn't matter. It's, hey, it needs to be addressed and looked at sort of thing. And yeah. how selfish of a person are you if you're like, well, they're just asking for attention and I'm not going to give them any. Just well, if you're five de- seconds of your day is not that big so of a it, deal. So yeah, in that particular argument, I think it also depends on if you're dealing with a child mm-hmm. or an adult. Because if you're dealing with a child, you absolutely 100% need to deal with it. Pay attention. It's a kid. It's somebody that's not fully developed. They can't process their emotions properly, maybe. They don't understand what's going on. That is 100% not their fault. If you're dealing with another adult that, say, is like a repeat you know, it's like, hey, yeah, you need help. I over it off one and time over to the wrong person. Someone had repeatedly called me. Oh, I'm going to kill myself, blah, blah, blah. And I was not, it was a, a boyfriend I had had that I'd broken up with and I was trying to distance. And it was an every night thing call, call, call. And I was trying to help, trying to help. And one night I got snippy and I went, you know what? Just do it. And I hung up. In- and the next morning, I got a phone call and it was very distressing because then it became my fault, even though they didn't succeed. It, it, it quickly became my fault that they had tried to do that, and I've never mm. really gotten over that. Well, and that is, but at the end of the day, it's another adult, and it's there is only so much you can do to help. So you can't make but the it's illegal. You doing, can't make somebody go the, to the doctor. The reason mm-hmm. I couldn't uh, talk them down from that is because I was busy playing D anD D. That's a valid reason. <laughs> Catherine said, I think it's like a drug addict. Once you have helped uh, and helped and supported and paid attention, but they still don't do anything to fix issues that they say are causing the problem, not physical problems. It's hard to continue to answer their cries for help. And it does get tiresome. Yeah. Well, I mean, beyond, and, and that, that was the point I was basically, <coughs> it's beyond tiresome, it's futile. It but you like, probably still you, shouldn't say, go ahead and do it then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe you shouldn't dare them. So, no. <laughs> but... You know, at a point, it gets to past trying to help somebody and enabling their ability to just use you as a crutch or to use self-harm as a crutch Mm -hmm. or things like that. Yeah, Bentley eventually got to the point where it was like, okay, I will take you to the hospital now. If you call me, I want you to take me to take you to the hospital to the the mental health care, you know, the, the psych ward. I will do that until you decide that I cannot help you anymore. Yeah. I have used all my spoons. But you would not do that with a kid. <laughs> no. Yeah. It, 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 well, that's the, that's why are... I said there's a difference. It, there, there's subtle levels. And I said it all in like super black and white. There but... is contemplations that like when people talk about putting their kids in psych wards and stuff like that. Um, to me, that's a very hard question because I've seen the way a lot of psych wards operate. And I'm well, worried what about they those, come out worse. What about that story I just shared recently about the 10-year-old kid that's being tried as an adult an for adult. that, like... Well, she did curb stomp a baby. I'm just throwing that out there. Oh, my God. I, I don't have, think I she haven't, should get tried as an adult. I can't think a, a more pertinent article that's made me think there is no answer that I'll like. Like, period. I don't think she should be tried as an adult. 
They'd also but brought up. She stomped on a baby's head to shut they, it up. They also brought up a lot of factors that the par- the foster parents had been reaching out for help. The kid hadn't been getting it, which I went through with my own kid, trying to seek out psychological help for her, and we just kept getting hung up on. Yeah, yeah. She they took her to a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist said, "Well, she's not really doing anything." The, she's so too young we we to can't. Put her in yeah, we, we we can't really yeah, do anything with it. Yeah, I dealt with this with, with my blah, daughter, blah. and at the end of that, I was just like, "What." this kid is going to kill herself and there is nothing it's yeah. like it becomes do i take him to a psych ward but then you're scared they're going to come out worse or they're going to hate you so in a lot of ways i feel for her foster parents and they didn't leave her alone with the baby they had gone outside and left the baby in the house and she had come back in yeah i i, I didn't um, i didn't know the full thing but um but the, even even if they had even if they left she's still well, 10 years it's old. a 10 year you don't you don't think well that 10 year old's got behavior problems it might kill the baby like that's not She's only two years older than like Andrew. She, like, she had behavior... Ten-year-olds have behavior problems. And they thought her behavior problems were worse than other ten-year-olds' behavior problems. But they didn't go to the psychiatrist and say, Hey, we think our ten-year-old might, might, be, a, might be a murderer. You know, no one thought that. Well, so there's two options with this kid. The problem is, oh, either she did not understand what she did... She's not capable of comprehending death. She was just trying to get the baby to be quiet. She was panicking. She was scared. And she's been a, she's a victim of abuse. I mean, an adult sometimes isn't in shake, their right mind. Yeah, they when, shake the F out of their babies. But she's a victim of abuse and neglect. She probably has seen her parents put hands on babies, her birth parents, or they put hands on her. And she thought that was the way you interact. Two, she's a complete sociopath. Yeah. And she's manipulating everybody. The problem is either when you go with... Either you put her, you let her go, you put her in healthcare. Even, and I you think let her even go. juvie is too much for her. She's only ten. But then you think, well, she killed a baby. So even if you put her in juvie and she, she survives can't be in that, the public, obviously, she gets out of juvie at eighteen. Then it just because the way juvie works, she just at eighteen is just back out in society now in that record they can switch up from juvie to adult prison if the crime's bad enough um if it's murder they actually have kids that have gone to juvie and been switched over to adult i, I mean there's some very serious factors but here she doesn't understand can, the levity of the crime that she committed uh, you think you can try a 10 year old as an adult i mean think about andrew legally and you co- can i think i just i was asking Christian's Morally, opinion i mean uh, think about the cognizance that andrew has Do you think you could try him as an adult andrew no me at 10? Yeah. Okay, My, yeah, you ki- probably could have tried me as an adult at 10. When I was 10, I don't know. I kids was... younger than Andrew right now are being forced to represent themselves in court, yeah. in immigration court right well, now. Well, that's obviously When not I right. was 10, I was already, you know, raising myself. Yeah, see, so. at 10, I would have been very cognizant of what that was, but my kids have been pretty sheltered in the grand mm-hmm. scheme of things, and I'm not sure they would. Caitlin, Caitlin probably I, more so. I would say Caitlin could have been tried for an adult at 10. But I think this girl, having suffered the amount of abuse and neglect she had suffered, is a lot more likely candidate to not be culpable. I, I, I definitely, maybe not the system, but she definitely needs medical. Well, and Allie brings up, you know, I, I watched that show, The Killer Kids or whatever, forever. There are cases of kids that young that are complete sociopaths. Yeah, they're the ones that you find dog bones under mm-hmm. their bed because they were torturing puppies and... Uh, but you know, like, that's that's gonna be a murder. Or, they a, have. Um, what's wrong with that? But they they identified this triad of things that go along with being eventually a serial killer, and they actually identified a brain pattern that goes along with being an eventual serial killer. And the question then became, what do we do with these people? Which is another: do, do you kill them? Do you, do you put them in a facility for the rest of your life? But they've actually found some early intervention techniques that they used it on one little girl. Um, Child of Violence, I think, was a documentary. And she grew up to be okay. They identified this triad. She had actually already started uh, abusing her baby brother and torturing animals and talking about murdering people. And, and then they, they clockwork f- orange her. <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh, they uh, helped her. And she... But sometimes uh, you can't uh, fix them. I don't know. I don't remember how we got off on this tangent because we were talking about suicide. It, I know it related somehow. Well, I think that I think that becomes part of the black and white morality of making that choice for someone else. 
let's say they're not a murderer, but they show every sign that they're going to become one. Do we minority report them? I don't uh, know. I, I don't think he... Uh, yeah, I it, think that's it, a black and white. It, and see, I always feel bad. Like the meta- okay, so in this particular argument we're talking about, you know, you want to trash on the medical system for not doing something to help her because they, they took her in for like evaluation, said she's got behavior problems. But she hadn't done it. Like, do you really hold people culpable for crimes they haven't committed yet? Not culpable for crimes, but when when my daughter was having problems and I went to five different psychologists and they said, she's too young. Either we can put her in care or you can F off. And I went, but something bad is going to happen. She's saying something bad is going to happen. Something bad is going to happen. It is their fault that they did not take care of that. Yeah. She does, So she has to kill herself before she can get treatment for suicidal ideation. She has to attempt yeah. it. Because I was 16. Just six. I was 16 when that counselor would probably have been held responsible whenever uh, oh, my... My significant other at the, at the time uh, found me on top of a parking garage about to jump off and beat the ever-loving crap out of me. But uh, I had gone to the counselor at school at 16, and I begged for help. I said, I really need help. My parents don't believe I have a problem, but I need help. And she just said, well, you just need to suck it up, buttercup. Yeah, she's comfortable. And so, yeah, and then I found myself standing on top of a parking garage. So I think... At 16, at that point, she should have been held responsible if anything happened to me. Yeah. And with my daughter, she was listing actual ways she could do it. Like, it wasn't just that, oh, she was six and we'd had a friend recently pass away and I thought that might be causing it. But she was listing, I could take all these pills. I could jump out in traffic. I could jump off a high roof. When they're listing ways... I don't care if she's that, only that six. That goes into it's the planning terrifying. stages. It's mm-hmm. terrifying. As um, a parent, that is terrifying. And I also wonder, on that same topic, too, is like, I wonder how many people are knowledgeable enough to know that, okay, nothing has happened yet, so I know I can't get the help I need. Like, no one will see me or help me. I can't get the, And so they basically, they're doing a suicide attempt, not actually, you, you know. Just wanting the help. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, and, and like so, it is a cry for. But they're they're doing it because they know they're not okay, getting help otherwise. Yeah, they know mm-hmm. if I go through the motions and I make it look really convincing that I was trying to, then people I can, will pay attention. Then, then. then I can actually get the help. Like mm-hmm. officially, they'll start trying to help me. Yeah, you don't even have to make it look convincing. We had a patient that jumped off a second story balcony, <laughs> and she got psych warded. She rolled her ankle. <laughs> that would just hurt. We had another guy try to hang himself from a doorknob. That's my deal with the suicide attempt. Is like I, I don't think I could do hardly anything because um, all of it hurts. So it doesn't have to be super convincing. If you just all of it looks painful. Say I tried to kill myself. You're going to the. That's what I worry about with like using a gun or something. I'd worry I'd miss, miss. and then I would just be like cripple forever. Yeah, I knew a guy and... in Cleburne that tried to shoot himself and ended up mentally handicapped. Yeah, and then at that is he point, happier now? Probably yeah, not. actually. <laughs> so maybe it kind of worked. Then I guess. No, nah, we we put a trigger warning on this episode. I probably shouldn't make jokes. Um, well, I think joking is how we all cope with these things. Yeah. Um, that is my coping mecha- mechanism is making jokes about it. Because I've had family members attempt suicide, and looking back, like when I was a kid and this was going on, I was super selfish about that. Looking back now, I'm wondering the kind of stuff they were going through. And, like, all I was focused on is, oh, you asshole, you tried to abandon me? <laughs> yeah. But, of course, I was a kid. I'm trying to remember now. I think the count now is, of the friends that I went to high school with, seven of them have committed suicide up to this year. Of the ten in your graduating class? Up uh-huh. in the- <laughs> I went to four different high schools, you know. But, uh, of all the people I went to high school with, which was a lot of people... Uh, but I have a friend, well, I have friends in different parts from the high schools I went to, and they kind of keep me updated about how crazy stuff goes down, but they all tell me about our friends that have off themselves, and uh, there have been a couple there that did cry out for attention, and they they just wanted somebody to talk to them, and we were all too busy, or we were all just, we thought it was, they were joking, or whatever, mm. and, and then they, they did the deed, and... I never felt the the selfish thing. I, I never thought the well, that's crappy. Why would they leave people behind? I was always just like, well, crap. I mean, 
the heck? Yeah. What I, was going on with you that, that, that you decided to do this? Because sometimes we didn't get any answers. I've taken on a bad habit of friending people for my chronic pain groups. The two of the main ones are the CRPS and the gastroparesis. And I get to talking to these people and they inevitably kill themselves. Mm -hmm. And I like the gastroparesis group because <laughs> they post every time someone dies. But they don't say due to gastroparesis or due to... It's all due to gastroparesis. Mm -hmm. Even if it's suicide. It's because of this. Because they're trying to bring awareness. Yeah. They didn't suicide because they wanted to suicide. It was because they were in pain yeah. because of the... Yeah. And they're starving to death. Like, gastroparesis starve you to death. And so, it sucks. So, yeah. I mean, it, there's a point where pain and, and hardship is so bad, suicide may not even be a choice anymore. Yeah. And, and I think that's the thing everybody gets hung up on, is if you're committing suicide, people are like, well, that was a choice. And, that, and people don't like the idea that you might choose to die because life is precious. Life is a precious gift that was given to you and you're choosing to throw it away. That's horrible. Well, not everybody's life is created equals a thing. What I might see as a precious gift might be a horrific yeah, what nightmare. Yeah, if you had the shit beat out of you your whole childhood, you're molested, tortured, and then you get cancer? Some people's lives are like that. But mm -hmm. another thing I've noticed about the chronic pain community is a lot of people commit passive suicide. They don't they don't take their meds yeah, anymore. Yeah, they just don't see a doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. They they don't take their they might take their pain medications, but they're not taking their other medications. I would they're, never do chemo, so I would probably do that too. It would depend would. on well, chemo. And I I'm I mean it chemo. depends on how much you want to widen that. Why is it not morally acceptable to decide to kill yourself, but it's morally acceptable to be obese and unhealthy so that you die from being or unhealthy smoke. or to smoke or drink or, or do any of these things that have such known high health risks that you're likely maybe it's over a very long period of time but maybe it takes you 72 years to commit suicide via cigarette well and the question but becomes so if i hadn't gone to the hospital for that blood clot and i had known it was a blood clot would that have been suicide Mm, maybe or would it have just been rolling the dice maybe it would have just been rolling it would did you know how bad it was did, did if you, i had no known, she had no oh, idea if, I, i'm saying if i had known how bad it if was if you had known how bad it was and just decided not to go maybe but again i think that that would be totally see i don't like no one would call it suicide I, I don't yeah i don't like thinking yeah. how close it was that you would because you were like i'm not eh, this is stupid i'm not going it took me and your husband just like berating you mm -hmm. into get fine, I'll go to the doctor. And then I took you, you know, and Stephen watched the kids. And, but you were like, ah, it'll get better. It's like, it, it hurts, but it's not a big deal. And it turned out like your leg was freaking, well, your leg had already been broken in the blood clot thing. Yeah. That kind of also, I guess, stems from the whole problem with the medical and the. the well, because is it passive suicide or is it money saving? Yeah, because none of us can afford to go to a doctor, and then a lot of them just write us off, dismiss us, and send us well, home. Well, shit. Anyway. The reality is, you can't afford to die either. It's just yeah. once you're dead, you don't care anymore, yeah. and that's why I said it becomes somebody else's burden. Yeah, it's going to become Aaron's burden mm -hmm. to to have to deal with it. I mean, the average funeral cost. Uh, twelve thousand dollars. Well, at least mine's free because I signed up for that thing. So, huh? That thing where they take your body, harvest your organs, do the science, they send all the stuff back and cremate oh. you. It's all free. Then um, whatever he does with my ashes past that point, I don't care. Go Shoot, I'm signing up for that. Yeah, do it. It's all free. But uh, yeah, I mean the fact that none of us can afford to go and get help. Yeah, or... my insurance rolled over. If I need to see a doctor, I'm foobar. Yeah. Yeah, my oh my god! I got that I, bill from the hospital. Visit. I'll tell you after the show. I told I got a doctor bill and I got totally screwed. I, I didn't get my whole HRA <laughs> when I enrolled last year, but my job told me that I had X amount and really I had half that amount. So when I went ahead and was like, "Well, hell, I got good insurance now. I'll go ahead and go to the doctor." Now I got a bill. It's like you mother. <laughs> and my option becomes manipulate the system and go to the hospital for everything that a normal person would consider hospital worthy so that my deductible gets met and then don't pay them <laughs> or have to pay the whole year and only get to see the one doctor. Yeah. Yeah. 
or that I have to see to get my meds, and if I don't get my meds, I will kill myself. Or you let one of us hit you in the hand with a tack hammer. Mm. <laughs> That's another thing with this CDC guideline is the jump in suicide um, they're seeing um, already in the chronic pain community. Yeah. Um, so they're leaving you with nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. You're in miserable pain. Opiates help you. Now, opiates don't help anybody. And studies show that they actually don't help that many people uh, in long-term care. But let's say you're someone like me who they do help. They help my pain. And then they take them away to a point where they are not helping anymore. And then they tell you you can't kill yourself. Yeah. So then you're just kind of stuck in this torturous limbo. Yeah, they want you to quietly die. But then when it comes down to it, they won't. They don't want die, you to do don't that. Don't talk about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. they don't want you to do that either. No. Die, but don't mention it. Don't make it public. Um, because I've literally had people on Facebook say, oh, if things are that bad, uh, die or buck up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. These are your options. And But they're not either. I but choose things. neither. And people act like it's something you can fight off with concentration and, and brute yeah. mental strength, and it's not. That's one of those uh, topics that we wanted to have a whole thing over with uh, people who think that you should just... You can fight through this. No. And I think a lot of these people, they also talk about family members of theirs that have had chronic pain. And I want to go, but all chronic pain is not equal. Yeah. Even if two people have the same condition with... It doesn't mean they're experiencing experiencing yeah. it the same. Well, I mean, all and three of you guys have uh, PC- Indo and PCOS. Yeah. Indo and PCOS, but y'all all have very different reactions to the same mm-hmm. things, treatments, and uh, um, symptoms. Yeah, you you deal with your uh, Indo pain and, and stuff like that a lot differently than Kristen because mm-hmm. you also have other pain conditions. So the pain part of it isn't as big of a deal for you as it is for them who don't have to deal with the other pain parts of it yeah but the 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 nausea and, and the the other parts of it are more brutal for you because like you would rather be in pain than be nauseous oh, by far. and like yeah. of course there's also the mental difference of like for me it doesn't really bother me that i'm not fertile it would bother the crap out of Allie because she wants kids and so we have the same thing but we are all experiencing it yeah. differently. And, and like, so when I And tell, it doesn't hurt me as much because I don't have ovaries. <laughs> like, when I tell people I have CRPS and I have them look it up. So there's the McGill pain scale and they go, oh, it's the most painful thing. Yeah, but that's subjective. Mm-hmm. So let's say I don't have it very bad. I only have it in my hand and it's not causing physical defects yet. I know people whose limbs are all sorts of screwed up from this. And eventually they do consider amputation because your bones start to degrade. But it's hard to explain to somebody that it's that subjective, that I can have a four millimeter kidney stone and be up and walking while someone else gets a one millimeter kidney stone and they're knocked down. Yeah. So that pain scale is just crap anyway, because saying you have a 10 or say that you have a four, that might have been your old 10. I want want to do I want you guys to do a whole episode on how the the pain scale thing has completely ruined ruined hospitals because 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 it's all about the surveys and stuff like that, because Mm -hmm. if they can't make your pain, it's not on the surveys anymore. It's not a vital anymore. They I I know, but but it it did so much damage in the time that it was, though. It's it's really actually ruined how hospitals so work. the mcgill pain scale works differently it's a bunch of different qualities to the pain and how much it interferes with your daily life it's like 80 qu- it's it's a big long mm. thing you all should do it on another episode yeah though. i was just <laughs> mentioning that uh, okay pain is so subjective that what might make one person want to kill themselves isn't even a blip on the radar for someone else and right. you can't yeah. base how you feel about others on your own experiences or anyone you've ever met yeah so final thoughts I think suicide everyone's doing it (laughs) physician assisted dying should be legal in all states and uh, suicide is already legal but uh, I think that people need to quit being so selfish and kind of look at things from other people's point of view and you can look into ways to you know vote towards this Mm -hmm. people who are vote for people who are okay with this um, try and make it a thing yeah this is it's definitely on, on like a, it's on the very, very liberal side of the liberal voting, mm. but it, it's definitely on the fringe of that, too. So it's definitely one of the small... But you're going to have to do a lot of repair to uh, 
you're gonna have to do a lot of medical reform first to make medicine more accessible anyway before you can even get into the details of um (laughs) quality of life uh improvements to the medical system i think but that that's a whole different episode right there a but lot to unpack yeah, there. Um, I'm definitely for in my final thought is I'm definitely for legalization of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there should be some checks and balances in it just to make sure that um, the the person the doing it isn't like accidentally being an accessory to self murder, you mm-hmm. know, like sort of thing. But man, it's easy to buy a gun. Yeah, I just I I don't know. I it's one of those things I don't have the answer to, but. Thanks for listening. Do you have the, the thing? Um, yeah. yeah, that was our show. We hope to see you back next week. I I don't know if next week's the one we're doing early so Allie can be on. Is it the third Thursday? I, I don't know. Um, thanks to all our supporters. Um, if you would like to catch past episodes of our show, you can check them out via our Facebook page, Podbean, or search for keywords Strictly Sickly in iTunes. If you have any questions or comments about tonight's topic, or things you might like to see covered on future episodes, please contact us via private message or send us an email at strictlysicklypodcast at gmail.com. Also, um, we are now av- you're now available on Stitcher and Spotify. And we'll do the NTP podcast tomorrow. Yes, we have. Yeah. But yeah, I'll post when I figure out what our next topic. I think I was going to do uh, politics and medicine. So the ironing out of the healthcare system and but I don't know, because that's going to take a lot of research, and everyone's still trying to get better from all these illnesses we've <laughs> had. All right. So, everybody have a good evening. <laughs>